Peace and blessings, everybody. Peace and blessings. Welcome to the first of two community discussions that are inspired by the open call for clemency, an online exhibition organized by releasing Asian people from prison, rap, and the confined arts, TCA. Right now, I'm going to give about 30 more seconds for people to chime in and connect. And what we're going to do is we're going to start our discussion. We are about four minutes after the five o'clock hour. I want to make sure that folks can log in right now. So first, the current pandemic poses an imminent risk of serious illness or death for people incarcerated or working in correctional facilities across the nation. According to data gathered by the Legal Aid Society, the infection rate at local jails is more than seven times higher than the rate citywide. This is New York City rates. And 87 times higher the country at large. An epidemiological model released by the ACLU and academic research partners has found that there will be nearly 100,000 more deaths than current estimates due to failures to reduce jails. This exhibition that we put up, Open Call for Clemency, urges governors to release those individuals who are most vulnerable during the growing an already deadly outbreak of COVID-19 among people who are incarcerated. This is not just in New York, this is also a national call to action. This exhibition, a little bit about the open call for clemency exhibition. The open call for clemency exhibition features works by artists who are currently incarcerated. The works reflect on personal responses to the current COVID-19 pandemic with a focus on the urgency and importance of clemency. The goal of this exhibition is to emphasize the humanity of those who are incarcerated, share their work widely as possible, and ultimately reach the governor's office to advocate for clemency, as I mentioned. I want to um, make a very clear connection as um, we have, as, as so much has been going on for the past Two weeks. I definitely want to make the connection between our criminal justice system and the racial systematic racism that we, we constantly hear being thrown around, talked about so much right now. Racial injustice. One of the biggest ways that this nation has um, committed a huge racial injustice is through the criminal justice system, which predominantly impacts people of color, but it doesn't um, exclude um, people who are not of color. So the criminal justice system has been um, very much one of the tools of this racial caste system. So we want to keep this conversation of mass incarceration and of releasing people during this time very open right now because these are the issues that spring out of racial injustice. So before we get into our conversation, I want to just tell you a little bit about the confined arts and the topic of discussion. And then I'll introduce these wonderful speakers. The Confined Arts is a community-led arts and advocacy program at the Center for Justice at Columbia University and the Center for Institutional and Social Change at the Columbia Law School. Our program cultivates and showcases the talents and creative voices of artists directly impacted by mass incarceration and intersecting social justice issues. Through artistry, collaborative activism, research, education, and training, TCA equips artists to influence policy change and use their artistry and knowledge to advocate for a world that's anchored on empathy and saturated with healing and preventative policies. That's a lot all to say that the arts, the confined arts mission is to change the narrative and to highlight the role of the arts to change the hearts and minds of people. 
Um, only the arts has the power to make human connections where areas, policy and legal strategies and other social strategies don't work. The arts has the power to get into those deeper levels of consciousness. And our goal is to use our artistry and highlight the voices of those who have been directly impacted by mass incarceration. With that being said, the topic of tonight's discussion is prison art as activism, exploring prison art as a petition for clemency. And for today's discussion, I will be moderating. Um, I'm Pastor Isaac Scott. I'm the program director for the Confined Arts. I, I want to introduce is Dr. Nicole Fleetwood, Professor of American Studies and Art History at Rutgers University. She is also the author of Making Time, Art in the Age of Mass Incarceration, a book that is based on interviews with currently and formerly incarcerated artists, prison visits, and her own family experiences with the penal system. Marking Time shows how the imprisoned turn ordinary objects, objects excuse me, into elaborate works of art, working with meager supplies and in the harshest conditions, including solitary confinement. These artists find ways to resist the brutality and depravity that prisons engender. And just reading that, it just resonated with me so personally because I am also an artist who um, learned art in prison during my um, incarceration. I was incarcerated for nine years. I've been home for about six years now. And art saved my life. And just thinking about all of the different tools and little things, crafts we had to make art. You know, I used to make cards with with hearts, spinning hearts in the middle. And it's like, how do you, how would you, how could you do that? And we were very crafty in there. So I love, you know, what this book brings out and it, and it speaks to the resourcefulness of um, people who are incarcerated to be able to use what is around them to cope and also lift their own voice. So I want to just thank Nicole for that. So could we just snap it up or clap it up for, for Professor Fleetwood right now? Thank, thank you. Thank you. Um, the next speaker I want to introduce is um, a good friend of mine, Mr. Kenny Reams. Um, Kenny Reams is a, he's a, he is an artist. He's um, yes, I want to make sure I introduce him first as a friend, secondly as an artist, thirdly as an activist, and then finally I'll tell you he's incarcerated right now. Um, Kenny is the founder of Who Decides Who, and he has also launched the Free Kenny Reams campaign. And Kenny is like our activist, as if he was out here right now. So I just want to, um, let's just clap it up, snapping up. So Kenny right now, the Kenny Reams on the line. Yes, yes, yes. And finally, our, um, our last speaker is Mary McPherson. Mary is the coordinator and co-founder of the Prison Creative Arts Project, which provides university workshops and networking opportunities for incarcerated youth and adults in Michigan and hosts the annual exhibition of art by Michigan prisoners. She also co-founded the National Prison Arts Coalition in California at the Critical Resistance International Gathering in 2008. Let's give it up for Mary. Yeah, Thank yeah, you. I'm super happy and super hype about that. And that long old introduction didn't take me as long as I thought. So that means we got more time to talk about this issue. I'm even more happy about that, right? So I wanna get right into this conversation. Yes, okay. So I want to get right into this conversation. The, the first question I'm going to swing, um, I'm going to swing it right to Nicole. And um, I'm going to ask, can you tell us a little bit about yourself and how your book, Marking Time, helps us to understand the power that prison art has in changing the narrative, as well as analyzing the culture of the prison industrial complex? I know that's like a loaded question, but I know you can handle it. <laughs> that's a great question. It's a huge question. Can you hear me OK? Yes. Are you, and, and, and here's the book. I don't know. You can't see it because of the, my backdrop, right? <laughs> right. I have images. I don't know if, if I can share them. Should, would I be able to share, share them? Okay, I can do that. Would you? Okay, so yeah. Um, so maybe I'll just walk through some of the images really quickly. Um, and Great. just to give, can you see, see this okay? Yeah? Yeah. Okay, okay, great. Um, so thank you so much for inviting me to participate. And also, you know, just thank you, Isaac, for being, um, you know, for having so many conversations with me 
um, as I worked on this book. We, we initially met, I think, in 2015 or 2016, something like that. Yeah? Yeah. 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 And so and we've done panels together and various events. So I really appreciate you as an interlocutor. And I think it also just shows um, for people who, who aren't familiar with the book, what the book is about. And it's really about collaboration with people. Like it's something that I could not have done by myself. Um, and as you mentioned, I, I interviewed several artists. And I think in total, I, I interviewed over 70 people, artists, formerly and currently in prison, family members. I got to talk to your mother, for example, and that was a really great, Isaac's mom, right? Yeah. So it was also having the voices of loved ones and family members and um, activists and organizers. Um, and so, you know, and as you mentioned, it does um, connect to my own family story and just growing up in a part of Southwest Ohio that was hyper incarcerated and seeing loved ones and neighbors just really just disappearing from the streets and, and sometimes for short periods of time and sometimes for, for the rest of their lives. Um, and I wanted to find a way of getting at that impact without focusing on um, uh, public, uh, like mainstream media. Often, you know, we, we're flooded with um, images of prisons, incarcerated people, criminalization, but it's all like dominant narrative or what a scholar named Michelle Brown says, um, penal spectatorship. So it's, it's ways of looking at prisons and imprisoned people that really reinforces the kind of logic of prisons and carcerality. And I really wanted um, to approach the book from a sense of people who are held in prisons and their practices of survival, their strategies of resistance, but for me, the most important thing was the ways that they were connecting with loved ones and building community and actually envisioning a, a future in, in different systems, another system um, that was about justice and healing and community and not about the, the structures of our criminal legal system. Um, and so I just want to, I'll walk through some of the images, you know, and so, so much of the book for me is in response to like, uh, these dominant images from the state, like this is a mugshot, an uh, archival mugshot that a scholar and documentarian Bruce Jackson shared with me, of a woman, Callie Brown, uh, who was in prison in the early 20th century in Arkansas. And you know, there's just this long history of these criminal indexes, mugshots, especially uh, of black people, brown people, indigenous people, immigrant people, right? So we see, if we look at the history of these criminal indexes, we'll also Look at this history of like how how prisons and criminalization are used to manage certain populations. Um, and I also looked at the work of um, a lot of contemporary photographers and artists like Shandra McCormick and Keith Calhoun, who are an African American couple out of New Orleans, and they use photography to document how prisons have impacted the people in their community in New Orleans, and and have had a long history of of, of photographing like Angola. And um, here's another photograph done by an imprisoned person at Lorton in Virginia. So you know this, uh, Isaac just walked off, but you know, most incarcerated people have very little access to photography. There's a great photography program by that PCAP runs called Humanizing the Numbers, right? But it's a, you know, it's very rare, few and far between. Um, and so I project, um, the Lord and Dark Room ran by Karen Ruckman was really important for me uh, to include in the book because you, it's, a, it's a tool that incarcerated people have very little access to. So I'm just going to show you a few images from the book. Uh, this is Ronnie Goodman's self-portrait when he was in San Quentin. And there's a lot of uh, self-portrait work in the book. And, the, and I talk a lot about the in, importance of portraiture. Um, and you mentioned the scarcity of tools and, and material access. And so Tamika Cole's Locked in a Dark Calm is, is a really great example of that, where she had discarded newspapers and magazines and um, graphite pencils. So she used this to create this really powerful work um, called Locked in a Dark Calm. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stop sharing right now, and I'll go, I have more images, but I want to make sure that we, you, you're able to ask questions of um, Kenneth and Mary, and then I can integrate more, more images as we continue to talk, okay? Yeah, th thank you so much for all of that, Nicole. That was, that was amazing, and, and yeah, that was, that was perfect. And I want to, um, everyone who's listening, I just want to encourage you to, as you're listening, um, drop your, your questions in the comment box. We, we will be monitoring them, and we will be asking.
in them at the end of this, um, at the end of the discussion. So please um, definitely utilize the chat and under the, the video. So the next question, Kenny, you there? You there with me, big brother? Yes, I'm here, Isaac. Okay, my brother, the, the, the next question goes to you, man. Can you tell us a little bit about yourself and where you are currently? And what has your relationship been with prison art for the past few decades? Well, uh, I would like to first start by saying uh, thank you and the Confined Arts for giving me this opportunity and platform to allow my voice to be heard and my story to be told uh, and to speak about the issues that we are currently talking about concerning the criminal justice system. I would also like to say next before I get into um, answering your question, for any of those that can hear my voice uh, that have just heard Nicole speak about the book, I would encourage you all that do not have the book or are unaware of the book to consider going out and purchasing the book because um, there's a very good detailed book on the criminal justice system in art and many aspects of the criminal justice system. With that said, uh, my name is Kenneth Reams, as you all are aware, and I am currently speaking to you all from solitary confinement where I am currently sitting on death row. I've been on death row now for the past 27 years of my life, almost 30 years. I was sentenced to death in 1993 under the capital felony murder rule. I'm not sure if any of you all are aware of that law, but the capital felony murder rule is an um, old antiquated law that originally took place and was adopted in England and then quickly spread throughout the world. However, the other countries that actually adopted the law, besides the United States, no longer have the law. We are the only country uh, in the world that continue to practice the felony murder rule. The felony murder rule is a law that pretty much allows the government or states to seek the death penalty uh, for individuals that may have not committed murder or actually killed the victim in the crime. In my circumstance and situation in 1993, me and a childhood friend of mine, we was both teens. I was 18 years old. He was 19 years old. We attempted to go and rob someone at an ATM machine that was in our neighborhood. We were seeking to get no more than maybe about $30 to help pay for his cap and gown in order to be able to walk across the stage and receive his high school diploma. Uh, being that we was living in poverty or what have you, we did not have the funding in order to simply pay for, you know, the meager $30 for his caps and gown and not trying to justify the reason why we committed the crime. Uh, that is what we was doing. In the course of the crime, my co-defendant, Alfred, he had the weapon. There was only one weapon in the crime. Um, there was no intent to cause bodily harm to anyone. There was no intent to hurt anyone, but that is actually what happened. Alfred, in a nervous state, accidentally pulled the trigger and shot the victim. The victim would be um, would be shot in... About three days later, they would take him off life support. So being that he was taken off life support, we was then placed in a position, a situation where they would charge us both with murder. We was both actually charged with capital murder for the crime. Alfred, my co-defendant, pled guilty to the crime, confessed to his role, and truthfully admitted to the fact that he was the gunman in the crime. And he accepted uh, sentence of life without parole for his involvement in the crime. They offered me also a life without parole sentence, which I thought would be a harsh sentence. I thought it was too harsh. At 18 years old, my first time in prison, I didn't kill anyone, and you all are offering me life without parole. That didn't seem fair to me. Uh, back then in 1993, we was not using the term that we use now, such as mass incarceration. Uh, we use the term more commonly today, but this was a part of mass incarceration, and it's a part of why the system today is so um, out of whack, 
I would say, and you have so many people uh, from poverty and color in the criminal justice system with long sentences. Anyway, I refused to accept the life without parole sentence, and they told me that if I did not accept the life without parole sentence, that they would seek the death penalty on me, which I thought was even more ludicrous because my co-defendant, as I stated, pled guilty to the crime and received a life without parole for his involvement in the crime. So how is it that you all are even speaking about seeking the death penalty on me? At that time, I had no clue or idea what the felony murder rule was. Um, anyway, I was placed on trial. And during my trial, instead of them, the prosecuting attorney, telling the truth about the events of the crime, they changed the story and told the jury that I was the actual gunman, that I uh, shot the victim and caused the death of the victim, which was not true. I was being represented by a part-time public defender. And I think that is key that I say that. It's one thing to be an indigent individual and to be represented by a public defender. But I was being represented by a part-time public defender who did not investigate the case, uh, my history, uh, or any of those things. He even refused to call my co-defendant into court to testify simply to the fact that he had already pled guilty just a couple weeks prior and was sitting in prison serving life without parole and that he was the actual gunman in the crime. Being that, they refused, being that my lawyer refused to call my co-defendant into court on my behalf, he left the jury open to the assumption that I was the actual killer as the DA was uh, pitching to the jury. The jury believed the story, and subsequently I was found guilty of capital murder and sentenced to death. I've been on death row now, um, as I said, 27 years, fighting to get the truth about my story heard, my circumstances, and trying to overcome um, this wrong that I feel in the criminal justice system. I'm not trying to say that I don't feel that I should not be punished because I was doing something that was wrong, even though crime, where I come from and in my environment, was um, an everyday comment. It was pretty much the art of the day. Uh, nonetheless, I was doing wrong and I victimized people in my community and I deserve to be punished. And I still feel that way. However, I've been in solitary confinement the entire time I've been locked up, um, which has been 27 years again. And in these 27 years, I've, I've learned a lot. I've grown a lot. I've dealt with a lot. Not only the pressures of solitary confinement, but also the pressures of possible execution. And this experience has, though I say this uh, openly and honestly, it has been a crazy experience, but the best experience in my life, because this experience has allowed me the opportunity to learn who I am as an individual. It has allowed me to understand what forgiveness is. It has allowed me to uh, work towards correcting the wrongs that I committed in my life at an early age. It has educated me. It has empowered me. Um, it has also placed me in a situation where I found love. Uh, so there's many things that I could take from this negative experience in my life. I am currently an artist um, that is gaining a lot of attention from the things that I am doing with my art, which I not uh, I not only began doing. Maybe I say I've been an artist my whole life, but I started seriously uh, trying to use the powers of art uh, to to speak about the injustice that I am witnessing in prison that I'm currently going through now, maybe about seven years ago, uh, when I started to create artwork around the practice and history of the death penalty in America and trying to educate society about those things from solitary confinement. And it's pretty much what I have been doing now for the past seven years of my life. I've had the opportunity of doing um, exhibits on an international uh, scale. I've had the opportunity of speaking to audiences around the world, having my story told uh, through a doc through documentary and, and many other things. And 
with that said, that's pretty much who I am in my story. And I'm thankful to be a part of this, this event this evening. Uh, Kenny, man, I love you, man. Thank you so much for sharing all that, man. Thank you very much for sharing that. I'm going to swing the next question over to Mary McPherson. Um, tell us a bit about your work and how and where have you seen art intersect with advocacy and what role has art played in your life? You're muted. I'm going to unmute you. Work. You're good. Thank you for inviting me. Um, first, I want to say hello to Kenny and God bless you. I had a felony murder case in 1976, six months after the end of the Vietnam War. So I ended up in the Detroit House of Corrections and went on to three other prisons and came home the summer after 9-11. Um, I've been there. I think that um, what's important that I observed inside was prison artists are first responders. You know, in the same way that uh, we send journalists and we send photographers in to film and record war, that's what's happening when you're looking at prison art. You're looking at those first responders that are reporting from the field and from the ditches and from the trenches and from the hell holes and rat's nests that are prisons. So when you talk about activism, it doesn't go far enough. You know, it's your life. You're fighting for survival. You're fighting to communicate what's happening to you. You're fighting to keep your sanity and your soul. You're fighting to, to just stay alive and be able to rejoin society by any means necessary. And so activism to me is recording history. I mean, the Carceral State Project now at the university has 60 researchers on 10 projects and they are systematically recording prison art in some of those projects and it's phenomenal. I mean, imagine 200 years from now looking at all that art and all that writing and all that recording. Imagine if we had had that during the Civil War in the way that we will now. So to me, it's, it's, a beautiful gift to be able to communicate what's happening and you know they're always worried about you talking on the phone or what you're going to do on a visit or what you're going to you know how you're going to tell the world what's happening and they try so hard to shut that out but they can't stop the genius of prison art and prison art communicates everything that they need to say to you in the darkest recesses of the night in their soul and it's a way of of sharing their humanity with us. And it's a bridge from the folks inside to here, to, to what's happening now. Oh man, Mary, you, you, that could not have been said better than what you just said. And um, the people in prison being the first responders. Um, and um, yes, because art is, art is a means of communication, right? And um, People in prison are using that art to um, speak and speak in ways where um, it may not be as comfortable to just say it. And also people may not pay as much attention to it if I just say it. You know, perhaps they'll, they'll receive my words and my pain and the story I'm trying to tell them if I put it on this medium, you know. So I, I, I really appreciate that. That really resonated with me. Um, I'm going to just keep it in the same order and swing on back to you, Nicole, if that's cool. Um, and we have um, about 28 minutes, so um, please feel free to share on this next question as much as you wanted to about the book. Um, and then, yeah, we'll let, um, I'll end with Kenny this time so that we can let him give the final word, because that seems the most fitting now, having heard everything. Mm -hmm. um, so the next question I just wanted to ask you was, how have you seen prison art act as a vehicle to express racial justice in the criminal justice system? Just, I want to make sure that I have to be, can you hear me? First of all, can you hear me? Okay, sorry. Yeah. Was I muted at first? I, <laughs> so. Okay, so I'm going to go back. I said I'm going to share the screen again because I, I, I'm, it's such an honor to be here both with Mary and Kenneth, who are artists. And, um, and as you know, um, 
Ken Kenneth is both in um, the exhibition that is currently online, the Open Call for Clemency, and he's also um, was in a show with Worth Rises, um, and he his work appears in the book. And so I wanted to um, to show this. What are you talking about? Um, um, racial justice and the criminalization of black people and also i think it's not just the criminalization but it's the extractive practices of prison so part of what prisons do is they not only do they hold people captive and they incapacitate and they remove people from communities they also impoverish families individuals families and communities right so they they drain resources be through the removal of people from prisons and also then impoverishing families and and whole communities right because you have like a whole like masses of people who would be contributing to a neighborhood or a street or a family locked in captivity um and not only are they locked in captivity then their families are charged all kinds of exploitative prices to provide some basic goods to their incarcerated loved ones, right? So it's just like this, all the industries that benefit from punishment and imprisonment. And so this piece here is one that Kenneth did on, when he was on from death row called Capitalization. And I'm wondering if you can unmute him so we can just kind of be in conversation about it. It's a piece that's in the book. And I think that it says so much about carceral capitalism in the way that prison, you know, which, you know, the way that um all kinds of industries profit from from prisons and punishment are we able to unmute kenny yes yes i'm here okay I'm here. so kenny hear. kenny i'm showing your work i'm showing capitalization it's on the screen for the audience can you talk about it because i think it's more powerful for you to talk about it with me than just for me to talk about it so can you tell us about the process of making this piece here? Where you have all well, the rappers. Um, I, think, I think there's a lot for me to say about that piece of artwork, to be honest with you. Uh, mm -hmm. The one thing that I can say is that, first of all, that piece of artwork had been in my head for years before I actually created the artwork. Uh, I had been approached by worth rises with the opportunity of speaking at their event and also uh, possibly creating some artwork and i wasn't really for sure what piece of artwork i wanted to create but then once i learned more about the organization and understood that they would be speaking about how um general society or what have you is you know gaining uh financial financial uh kickbacks or what have you from the people in prison on many different levels i thought about creating that piece of art that had been in my head for so long and when i chased the idea of creating the artwork what i did was ask all of the individuals on death row to give me their trash uh anybody that had a that's, that's willing to give me your soup packages, your chip packages, your beef summer sausage package, any package that you can give me that came from this company, give it to me. And they start laughing at me, really. You know, what you gonna do with this stuff, Kenny? It's trash. Well, I'm gonna create some artwork out of it. And literally they laughed at me. And I told them why I was creating it and I was going to send it to New York for a contest. And they kind of thought I was kind of half crazy at the same time, even though they knew that I was a uh, you know, pretty good artist. Anyway, I, I put the artwork together and, and I sent it uh, to Earth Rise and it was in a, the contest and it actually won first place prize. Uh, but not only did it win first place prize in that contest, uh, someone also purchased the artwork and gave me uh, $1,000 for the artwork. And when the individuals back here in prison realized that I had won first place and someone purchased the artwork for a thousand dollars, it changed their perspective on art. Um, and I was able to recognize that and see that that was a powerful thing for me. It actually also encouraged some of the individuals who had not considered themselves an artist, such as like Isaac. Isaac said earlier, you know, that he became an artist while in prison. 
and art changed his life. That's one of the things that I'm always constantly trying to encourage individuals to do, whether it's through creative writing or or visual art or storytelling, music, you know, get up and be productive with the talents that you may have or, or that's around you. And for me to see the inmates respond the way they responded from that piece of artwork has been more powerful than the money that I think that they're making mm -hmm. off of us uh, through that system and, and through that company. Thank you, Kenny. Yeah. Thank you, thank you, Kenny. That I appreciate that, and given the context on that, I can imagine you asking everybody for their old rappers <laughs> and folks like, "What you doing, man?" I can just imagine that. But look at what you created, and look how inspiring it was. And that doesn't even take into account how many lives were saved when they saw that you did that and it yielded these fruit and, and people wanted to also follow in those steps. So I, I definitely want to commend you on that. Um, Mary, I want to ask you the next question. Um, since the eruption of the COVID-19 pandemic, many art institutions have paused their work, changed focus, or shut down altogether. What new exciting work have you seen come out of all of this time? PCAP in particular, uh, the Prison Creative Arts Project in Michigan, go from workshops inside where for 30 years, um, we went into the facilities and had workshops in the prisons, uh, in physical presence in person to now being uh, forced to do remote work. So I'm home for the next year or so. And now we're looking at correspondence courses by mail or correspondence workshops by mail in the manner in which correspondence courses um, are allowed. And that actually gives us the opportunity to reach places in the UP, reach places where we can't, it's too far for us to be able to drive except for the collection and the curation of the art. So. Um, that's happening. Um, we're reimagining new ways to connect with prisoners and families and show art. And so the um, exhibition that had a preview online this year literally went around the world and people were able to see the art that had not, you know, been physically um, able to come to the university to see the annual exhibition, which was now in its 25th year. So that's uh, been exceptional. But also, I want to say that in the movement now um, is the cry defund police and I believe we should defund the carceral state. So I'm hoping in these um, outreaches in the communities that we could reconsider the opportunity now to be able to have um, local parole boards. Why should one parole board in the state have sovereignty and be able to rule on thousands and thousands and thousands of people when they're political appointees and they answer to the governor? Thank you. Mary, you just said something that was so profound. You said defund the carceral state. Absolutely. Carceral because, state. Um, yep. yeah, That's because that abuse doesn't yeah, that abuse doesn't just exist out here with the police. It, it exists two, three, four times worse inside of inside of prison. Nicole, I want to just throw an extra question to you, if it's okay. And what are your thoughts on on this um, defunding the carceral state? You know, not just focusing on defunding the police. Are you? You're, I think you need it. Can you hear me? You're muted. Yes. Can, can you hear? Okay, great. Okay, okay. And I, so Mary, that was really powerful what you said. Thank you very much for saying that. And I'm, I'm right now, I'm, I'm trying to, um, I'm posting uh, PCAPs, uh, a link to PCAP in um, our Facebook live chat because I want people to see the incredible work that's happening in Michigan. Um, and, you know, for me, um, I, I love art. And so writing about art for me is always inspiring, but everything about prisons is absolutely depressing, inhumane, brutal, and is 
to me, evidence of um, our larger society's devaluation of entire populations. And so I believe prisons, I'm an abolitionist, I believe prisons, and I don't mean that in any abstract ways. I think that we have, you know, we're at a moment where we see people reconfiguring what, it, what community looks like, what belonging looks like, what it means to take care on a local um, and national and even global level with the, this pandemic, right? And we see leaders failing and we also see people rising up in, in, this, in really fearless ways, demanding another way of, of being and living and inhabiting this planet, right? And so I feel like what we're doing, what we, what we are literally in the process of doing partly out of the failure of leaders in so many ways, right? And like the fact that we have 114,000 people dead in the US alone, and that's the recorded numbers. And those numbers are disproportionately black people, brown people, the Navajo Nation is like one of the hottest spots on the planet poor people, and we're not even accounting for the numbers in prisons. We started getting some numbers coming out of prisons and a lot of states stopped testing because they don't want to make public how, what a, a massive failure the idea of public health is, especially in carceral institutions. For me, all of this is like, surreal that this is like if people don't know what abolition means this is evidence of like why we need abolition because these are these are death machines right and you know the production like george floyd that was not an anomaly that's not anomalous we had we all witnessed it we were all in homes in our homes many of us aren't working so and we're a, a type of captive audience that maybe we haven't been in the past, right? And I think other people are starting to see what it means to live a life of precarity and vulnerability and have systems fail, right? And so we, I think that this is a moment where so many people who were, who I had a friend just last week saying he didn't believe in defund the police. And this week he says, I do now. He's like, there's enough momentum and, and and people showing what it could look like right that we this is not a pie in the sky dream this is something that we can actually recreate i'm not saying i think we're at a moment you know where also all the forces of, of um repression authoritarian regimes are doing everything to monopolize and capitalize on this moment right but we we can't we have to be absolutely vigilant about demanding and creating another life, another world. Now, thank you, thank you, thank you for saying all of that. This is, um, yeah, I'm, a, I'm also an abolitionist and um, I, I appreciate hearing abolition spoke about in a very plain and clear way and not so much in an abstract way. I think one of the, the, um, the things that has held back the abolitionist argument um, has been that there it hasn't been clear and it hasn't been like really thought out and it's really emotional and it's like this doesn't need to exist and it's like well why and it's not really a strong enough argument and the arguments now are being well one the police are helping make the argument on their own but secondly um on 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 our end abolitionists have clear ask and they're saying no this is not what we're talking about you think it's just about taking money out no it's about redistribution of funds and doing this and taking money out of places that punish and putting them into places that prevent and heal and all of that stuff so um yes so again i appreciate this um this discourse of abolition because we are like you said nicole in a space where people are listening now if ever there was a time where people were listening, I can't believe it, I'm so shocked. People are so hypersensitive to race right now. I feel a little more safe, right? As a black man, I feel like maybe I might not um, go through some of what I've went through before because people are now thinking about it at least, you know? So, um, and I'm sure you can, um, you can attest to that as well as a black woman. So it's, 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 it's very interesting, um, the, the space we're in. So I appreciate that, Mary, that call for defunding the cost real estate. Um, with our last um, bit of uh, 12 minutes, I'm going to let 
Kenny sort of take us home with this last question. Kenny, you still with us, big brother? Yes, I'm with you all. Okay. Cool. So this is that three-part question we was going through yesterday. <laughs> um, do you think art has given you a new perspective on certain aspects of yourself as a Black artist and activist? And or has it opened you up to see justice or injustice through a more holistic lens? My question, uh, I mean, my answer to that question uh, would be yes. As an individual, I believe their art has saved my life. And I'm sitting on death row. I believe their art has, I know their art has helped transform me in many ways, emotionally, spiritually. Um, and I also know that art has been a tool for me to understand my purpose in life. These are things that art has done for me therapeutically. No if and buts about it. And I'm sitting in solitary confinement. To be sitting in solitary confinement and not having the tool of art um, could make solitary confinement a little bit more dangerous, I would say, because when I am able to work on constructing a guitar or drawing a picture or whether it is about the movement or the criminal justice system or just uh, working on a piece of art that someone has commissioned for me. That has given me the opportunity and the time of taking my mind from the inside of the box to outside of the box. And that is always a powerful thing, especially uh, for individuals that's in solitary confinement, such as myself. Uh, now, can you give me the the second part of that question, please? Again, can I, I, can, I can I chime in because Kenny, I think uh -huh. one of the things that can you hear me? It would be great yes. if you talked about. You did this really powerful series that I think people need to know about, and it's those portraits of of historically portraits of people who've been on death row including one of the youngest people ever, this young black man, black boy. Yes. Can, Andy, can you hear me? Yeah, can you talk yes. about that series you've done? You've done this really powerful series on people who've been condemned. Yeah. Well, that was one of the first things that I began doing when I actually started to uh, work on educating society about the death penalty. Um, through art. I learned very quickly that as an activist against the system, the things that I have witnessed and seen, it's one thing to get caught up in arguing whether this is right or this is wrong. You're now debating a person's opinion. You know, well, I'm against the death penalty or I feel that these people should be locked up. I feel that this should be a person's individual sentence and those things. That's easy to do. But I learned that through creating artwork and presenting it to people and allowing them to think about the art and learning of the story was more powerful. One of the, the images that I created early on was that image of George Stinney. Uh, George Stinney was an individual that was sentenced to death, uh, I think, in the 1940s. He was uh, 14 years old, and it has been ruled now all of these years later that George was actually innocent of the crime. Anyway, George Stinney was... Uh, sentenced to death for supposedly killing two young white girls um, and his his story in itself is just crazy because how is it that we as a society can literally do these things they literally put the man in the electric chair he was so small that he didn't even fit in the chair so they set bibles in the seat of the chair just so he could sit up in the chair this is crazy, man. What are we really doing? And see, for me to have a debate with somebody about the death penalty and those things, 
concerning George Finney's situation, they would find all type of reasons why this or that. But when you put this piece of artwork in front of them, you're first struck by the image. Whoa, who is this? What happened? When did it happen? Those things. And then when you learn of the story through going and reading more detail about the story, you then begin to question the criminal justice system. Why are we doing this? Why did we do that? And those things. And I managed to find a lot of different stories about the, the history of the death penalty and just started telling people's story. The first man that was um, exonerated you know, let me just go and draw his picture and then put his story in front of people. Uh, the first lady that was executed in the electric chair. Let me go and find her story and draw her picture and put it in front of people. The youngest person, because George was not even the youngest. The youngest person was a little girl that was 12 years old. 12 years old. They literally hung a 12-year-old girl. Um... In, in in Connecticut. So I, I went through the process of creating a whole, and I'm continuing to even now, but creating a whole lot of images of people who had been through the uh, criminal justice system with the death penalty. And that image of George Stenny that you're speaking on, um, Nicole, is one of the images that I receive a lot of remarks on. And it's shocking to me sometimes when I have young individuals that are 20 years old, 17 years old, that's just now learning about George Denny when they see the artwork and it, you know, it shapes their thought and their opinions. So I, I would say that about those um, collections of portraits that I have worked on. Uh, thank you, man. Thank you for sharing that, Kenny. So I'm what, gonna. What was the I'm second going to, uh, one of your? Oh, go for it, my brother. Go for it. What was the second part of your question that you had asked me? The second part of the question was um, how um, the first part asked about your new perspective um, as a black artist and activist. The second part asks, has it opened your eyes up to injustice in a more holistic lens? Yes, yes. And I say it from the standpoint that it has opened my eyes because before I really started to use my talent as an artist to speak about the criminal justice system and to educate people about the criminal justice system, I really did not look at artwork that I would see from inmates because prior to me uh, becoming an activist and doing the work that I am doing with my nonprofit and, and all of the other things, I would see pieces of artwork that inmates uh, throughout the country had created. And okay, whoa, I like that. But it did not make me think deeper about the criminal justice system uh, in a more holistic way. Uh, uh, like the other lady said when she made the statement that we are on the front line. We are um, the ones that are pretty much carrying the story of the criminal justice system through our different forms of art. When I began to see those things uh, more clearly from other people's artwork, it helped me to understand different other perspectives of the criminal justice system that I had not even thought about. So now today as an activist, when I go into different um, other, when I'm a part of different other events or gallery showings with multiple other individuals who are in the criminal justice system, when I see their art, it, it speaks to me different. It, it, it helps me understand more of the injustice because though I'm here, I see it only from a different lens, but there are so many things that uh, can be taught through the arts about the criminal justice system. And that is the, the, the one thing that I have recognized uh, more so as an activist and as an individual that is involved in the work uh, through the prison systems when it comes to artwork. But as for the injustice aspect of it, man, we can, we can go on for days and talk about these things when it comes to art because 
there's so many different layers to it. You know, uh, the lady just a few seconds ago mentioned, you know, de cost me uh, defunding the criminal justice system. Whoa, that's just one injustice aspect of it. You know, uh, the long sentences that we give to individuals. Yes, I'm, I'm for, you know, saying that an uh, individual did wrong and they should be held accountable, but whoa, you know, seriously, you're giving somebody this individual been locked up for 39 years and he only stole nine dollars. Is this cool? Is this correct? Is this fairness? Is this justice? But this is what we're doing in America. Or such as now, I'm speaking uh, on this panel or what have you, and the Confined Arts is paying for my telephone call. And this telephone call is costing like $30. Seriously, one telephone call, $30? This is this is crazy. And this is what the criminal justice system in America is 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 about. I'm all for that statement. How do we remove the money from the criminal justice system? How do we uh, stop allowing the criminal justice system to take advantage of the people that are in the system? Because we all know that the majority of the people that is in the criminal justice system today are people that come from poverty people that are uneducated, how do we better help these individuals instead of what I would say you are exploiting, you know? How is it that you're supposed to be fixing something when you're exploiting it? So these, these are the things that I say. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that, Kenny. So in closing, I want to first just thank um, all of our speakers. I want to thank um, Kenny. Thank you very much, my brother, for calling in and always being available and um, always being ready in season and out of season. I call on you a lot and you're always there. And I think it's important that people hear it from you and not just from me. You know, I, I'm formerly incarcerated, but every day that I'm home, I'm a little more removed from what that raw feeling of being in prison is like. You know, and I think that it's important that, that folks hear it from people who are in there right now suffering this injustice um, heavily right now. So I appreciate you. I want to um, also thank Mary. I think Mary signed off, but I want to thank her very much for her participation. Um, and finally, I want to thank um, Professor Fleetwood. Thank you so much. For that. I really appreciate you. I just want to say that publicly. I so appreciate you so much. Um, it's been like, um, yeah, since like 2016, it's been a long time coming and I, um, you've seen me grow a lot <laughs> and I appreciate um, you continuing to um, do this work with us and on behalf of all of the artists who, um, who are incarcerated and who are formerly incarcerated. So I just want to thank you for that. Um, as it relates to clemency, there is an open call for action on the website. When you go to the exhibition, for this panel discussion. It is called opencallforclemency.com. When you go on the website, after you view the exhibition at the bottom, there is a call to action and how you can get involved and what you can do. So please take a look at that. And I want to give Kenny the last few words to tell us about the free Kenny Reams campaign and what people can do right now to support Kenny. It's on you, my brother. Well, I would say, first of all, if anyone uh, who can hear my voice is interested in me, uh, my story, my artwork, um, and even my call for clemency, I would say, uh, which I feel that I deserve, which I know that I deserve because the court system have already said that uh, they ruled on those actions of 2018. However, here it is, 2018. 20 and I'm still sitting on death row. Um, I would encourage you all to go to the free Kenneth Rings org page to learn more about um, the work that I'm doing to uh, maybe watch the documentary. There's a link uh, somewhere on that website where you can um, watch the documentary that will give you more detail about my life, my story. Uh, in the work that I'm doing. You can also, uh, I would encourage you all to go to the the website as well to 
click on and sign the petition, the free Kenneth Reigns petition. I am trying to get as much help and attention as possible around my case, my story, because I honestly feel that I should no longer be um, in prison and uh, I should no longer be in solitary confinement sitting on death row. As I said, in 2018, the Arkansas Supreme Court, after 25 years or so, ruled that it was unjust for them to sentence me to death and that I, not, I should not be um, on death row any longer. However, I'm still sitting on death row and that the courts must decide whether they're going to give me a new trial because of the racial issues that took place in my case. I was sentenced by a jury that was composed of 11 whites and one black. However, I come from a community that was composed of 55% African-American that in itself is wrong. And this is another issue about defunding uh, the criminal justice system. Um, so those brief things I would say, if there's anybody um, interested in me, then please go to the free Kenneth Rings, uh, org website and learn more and get involved in the, in the case and learn more about me. I think you all will find that I'm an Ken interesting Ken individual. We posted um, in the Facebook live chat both uh, the change.org petition and there's over 131,000 who have signed. Even in the last hour, I've seen a couple hundred people sign. I've been watching it as, we, as we've been on. And we also posted the free Kenneth uh, Reams, your website. So they're, 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 we've shared them with the audience here. Um, Ma Mary popped back on, and I think we should hear from her before we sign off. She disappeared again. Mary, are yeah. you still there? Uh, I was just thinking the same thing, Nicole. I was just thinking the same thing. I was so glad she popped back in. I think she might be having tech issues because okay. Okay. the last time we had did a vent, um, she had issues with the camera. Okay. Yeah. So, um, yeah, yo, um, I appreciate that. Nicole, do you have any final words, please? I, I just want to, I want to support what Kenneth said and also uh, thank you for creating this, this space for these conversations to, to be had and you, you've been consistent and you've been really committed. You said that every day that you're out of prison, you're further away in some ways, but I, I don't, I think you stay so committed and connected to everyone in prison and that you see your freedom as intertwined with their freedom. And I, and I just want to praise you for that. And thank you for having, for making this forum and, um, and having these conversations. They're so important, Isaac. So thank you. Thank and you, thank God. you to your family too, because they're, I, I, I know this is a family. This, this is a team effort, what you all are doing. Yeah. Yeah, because my mother, I mean, my mother, my wife has Kenny on the phone in the other room. We had to figure out how to navigate this. So, yes. So, it's I, a team effort. Uh -huh. All right, guys. Well, so, we're going to sign off now. Okay. I'm going to end this live feed. But thank you, everybody who was watching. I'll stop the live feed and I have to stop and then receive the email.